how many people, when they were growing up, knew a person with autism? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. How many people know a person with autism now? Right, so clearly something has changed, something is going on, and a, a lot of us need help trying to decipher what's going on. What's really exciting to me about this conference, it's taking the two camps that have focused on treatment for these children, people who know a lot about biomedical interventions and people who know a lot about behavioral interventions, and bring them together. Now, it's one step to bring all these people to the same conference, and it's another step to actually get both sides to understand and integrate why you need to appreciate what goes on in both of these schools of thought. So I, I'm taking a leap of faith and hoping that I am able to do a good job with that today. My background obviously is a very strong science background, but as you know, anybody who has a child with autism, even if they do suffer from biomedical issues, they have gone through a very long period of abnormal or different development, so they have to go through behavioral intervention to learn how to behave properly. So it, it's really the combination of the two where you, you end up seeing optimal successes. I was really glad that I have an hour and a half too because I have a really, really long presentation and I'm going to try really hard not to talk too fast. So with that, um, I will begin. And I, I wanted to show this picture at the beginning. This is a painting by a painter, uh, John Foppel. What he does is he creates paintings, sells them, and part of the proceeds donate to the organization that he makes this painting for. And underneath, it's like it, the, the quote says something like, 97,000 days in solitary confinement and still counting. And I want you to keep that in mind while I'm giving the talk, because at the very end of this talk, I'm going to read you something that was written by a child with autism. He's completely nonverbal. The only way that he can talk is through facilitated communication, where you can use a laptop to help you communicate with whatever it is you're communicating with. And I, I just want you to keep this in the back of your mind when I read this to you at the very end of my talk today. And his parents graciously let me have a copy of this so I could read it to you all today. And what we also need to understand is that it's something that affects normal brain functioning. These are like all the red flags that you're supposed to look for when your child is diagnosed. I'm sure everybody's familiar with these things. Not making eye contact, not smiling, not pointing, not waving bye-bye. So all these things that normal you know, infants do while developing, children with autism don't necessarily do. And it affects them in a variety of different ways. Um, it, it affects basically their communication, social skills, and reasoning skills. So I, again, I wanted to show examples of play that children do that you traditionally don't see going on necessarily. Maybe one or two of these things with, for, for children with autism. And again, different ways. Some kids are really social. Some are kind of sort of social. And some aren't social at all. So it, it, they're in, completely individualized and completely different. And I wanted to show this also because each one, each child has their own you know, individual way of representing and expressing how they feel. And you as parents as, or as caregivers have to look for what it is that they feel comfortable with and, and focus in on that area where you can reach them because they are in there. And if you don't walk away with anything else after my talk today, I want you to realize they might not be able to tell you, they might not be able to express that to you, but I'm going to teach you signs to look for so you can help figure out maybe what is going on with them and, and do the best that you can to help them have the best quality of life that they could possibly have. And I, I kind of like this. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of the thing, a lot of the things that these kids do behaviorally do wrong. So as you're doing behavioral interventions, what you want to do is reduce the negative behaviors and increase the positive behaviors. You, know, you don't want them inappropriately giggling or laughing, but maybe there's something else that's causing them to do that biomedically. So if you can look into that, maybe you can get rid of that behavior. You don't want them hitting themselves in the head or hitting somebody else, but maybe something's bothering them and that's the only way that they can express that to you is by hitting themselves. But at least they're trying to do something to get your attention. I'm not going to go over all these, but I just wanted to give you an example of the abnormal behaviors that we're trying to move away from. And the tricky, tricky part, and I tell every single parent this, and I've been in this for a long time. Uh, I, actually, I have a child. Uh, she's 13 years old now. She has made worlds of progress because of the people that I've met. Maybe somebody that you meet in this room today, maybe somebody who's sitting next to you right now will change your life. The very first conference that I went to, 
changed my life. I, I couldn't believe the people that I met who are still a part of my life now. Now, when I thought about, you know, when I was a teenager and I was going to meet some guy and I was going to get married and we were going to have kids, and I didn't think, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great if we had a child with autism too? I mean, I know that's not like the kind of stuff that you think about that that's how you want your life to be. But the reality is that's what our life is and we have to deal with that. So going back and saying, you know, is that what my life, would, would I envision it to be? No, but then again, so many of the people that I have met on this journey, I would not have met had my child not been affected. And they are some of the most, you know, precious people, people I would be friends with my entire life. And, you know, I wouldn't change that for the world. And although, you know, life can be very challenging and frustrating at times, you know, I've met some incredible, incredible people, and I hope you all find that you go through that same experience. But if, going back to this, what I want to say is when I did go to that first conference, you, know, you, you hear so much information. And you, sometimes you don't even know what to believe. And you hear people, you know, go for, for hug therapy, $10,000, your kid will be cured. Or go see this physician, he'll charge you $20,000. And he'll do all this testing, and your kid will be cured. I hate to tell you this, but there is no known cure. But there are treatments, and there are things that you can do to make the quality of your life and the child that you work with or your child's life significantly better. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, I'm not a behavioral therapist, but I know just from working with children, working with families, working with my own child, you know, you need to understand that these skills are documented. There's, there's published literature that's, that states clearly that ABA therapies, things like behavioral interventions, do work and do make a difference in many individuals with autism. However, in recent years, within the past 10 years, uh, there's a lot of new biological science that's coming out that seems to justify some of the things like organizations like Autism Research Institute has been saying for the past 20 years, things like B6 and DMG can make a difference in some of these children's lives. Well, research is coming out now that supports and explains why this is the case. So ultimately, though, what you need to think about is that, okay, now I understand, you know, there's some science that explains why some of the biomed stuff works. I know for sure, because there's tons of research that the behavior stuff works, doesn't it only make sense that you need to implement both these things together? So what I'm going to try to do today is just, you know, I'm not going to go into great detail about any particular thing. I want to give you an overview, give you a taste of everything, kind of give you the, the foundation so that you can understand maybe some more detailed scientific inf information that's going to be presented or somebody's more focused behavioral intervention that's, that's brought forward in somebody else's talk so that you can make smart decisions about what you're going to do with your child or your therapy or your practice. Um, and again, why both together? Because many children suffer from real comorbid medical conditions. And it's just like, you know, uh, say a kid has like severe diarrhea. Well, he's got autism. Well, you know, so what? He's got severe diarrhea or terrible, terrible eczema or, um, you know, rashes all over his body. Well, he's got autism. Well, actually, no. That child deserves to have real medical treatment for wherever it is that's bothering him because guess what? Maybe he can't tell you that these things are bothering him. You know, and you just kind of like, well, you know, he's just flapping her head. Autism. 